morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. We begin our second series of treasures from the Rabbi's Library. But you're not actually in the Rabbi's Library right now because where I am is in Fresh Meadows. I'm visiting my daughter and son-in-law, but much more importantly, my two granddaughters, one who I've uh, had never seen until uh, last week. So it's a real pleasure to be here and uh, to be able to share with you treasures from my library which I've actually had to take with me and uh, so I had to forego on some of my sartorial elegance to make room in my suitcase for the books and bits and pieces that I brought with me and I'm going to share them with you today. Now the first piece I'm going to share with you today is not actually an old book although it's based on an old book and I've, I've spoken about it many times in fact I've published a number of articles about this particular manuscript that is in my possession and it's the manuscript of the memoirs of the late Rabbi uh, Tzvi Hirsch Ferber who was the Rabbi of Soho in West London, in the West End of London. It's not a place that's known for its vibrant Jewish community yet he was the Rabbi there from 1915 for about 40 years and then lived out his retirement years in Soho but he was from Slabodka and he learned in yeshiva and he was a big Talmud Chochem and a Talmudist and he published more than 20 books, most of which I have. But much more importantly, as uh, I've explained in the past in articles that I've written, but which will form the introduction to what I'm about to show you, um, I obtained his memoirs, manuscript memoirs, and it's a long, circuitous and difficult and uh, interesting route uh, that actually um, made its way to me. Uh, eventually I obtained this uh, the copy of his memoirs and I have them and I've now here we here we go this is what I wanted to show you last week I finally completed what you're seeing here is 320 pages of his memoirs which I've now been through corrected I have um, put it in order and uh, it's this is the first draft hopefully going to be ready for publication as you can see even though I've done it already here some corrections that I've added in which uh, tomorrow I'm going to be taking with me to Lakewood and we're going to be speaking to the publisher and be uh, arranging to have this incredible record of the life of an Eastern European rabbi caught in Western Europe in England in a community that didn't appreciate him a 50-year record of his life um, first of all, written as an autobiography and later on written more like a journal. It's a fascinating account. Um, I believe that it's one of the most important historical records of rabbis of this genre ever to be published. I'm very, very proud of the fact that I'm going to be able to publish it. And I look forward to sharing more details uh, about that with you when, uh, when they emerge. But I just wanted to show that to you. So this is one of the fat books that I had to take with me. Uh, and therefore forego some of my sartorial elegance, as I said earlier. Now, I'm not sure where to start. I know that uh, we advertised it in one particular order, but uh, perhaps we're going to start in a different direction. Uh, I'd like to begin today's treasures with a fascinating story. And as you know, I don't see books as books. I see books as stories. Because every book has a story. It's not just the book that was published and the words on the page. It's the person who painstakingly put that book together and made sure that there was a publisher and how the publisher addressed publishing that book. And then the person who book bought the book and owned it originally and the many hands through which a book has passed until it's finally made it, its way into the rabbi's library, into my library. That is the story of the book or the stories surrounding the books and the manuscripts which I have in my possession. And today I wanted to dedicate this, the first in my second series of treasures from the Rabbi's Library, I wanted to dedicate it to a friend of mine who passed away from COVID-19. I wrote an obituary for him. His name was Moshe Leib Weiser. He was one of my mentors in the collection of Jewish books and in understanding the importance of Jewish bibliography and of course Jewish history. I knew him for about 20 years and spoke to him 
just a couple of months before he died, when I was in Israel with Meir, I spoke to Moshe Leib Weiser about a particular historical um, episode and an individual that I wanted to find out a little bit more about. And sadly, I heard just a couple of months later that he had died, and I was very, very sad, saddened by, to learn of his death. And therefore, I want to dedicate this uh, episode of Treasures from the Rabbi's Library to my late friend Moshe Leib Weiser, Zichroni Lebrocha, and uh, hopefully it can be a benefit and a merit to his memory. And I want to do so by um, sharing with you a book that I bought from him that was actually his and that is extremely rare. And this was really Moshe Leib Weiser down to a T. He was such a generous spirited man one day I came into his, um, I don't know what to call it, it, was, it wasn't a shop, it wasn't a warehouse, it was somewhere in between. It was a place where there were tens of thousands of books piled up high in shelves and on the floor, and boxes and all kinds of things. And he said to me, um, I want to sell you something. So I said, okay, I'm here to buy. What is it? He said, well, it's very, very rare and it belongs to me and it was dedicated to me. But I know that you are such an aficionado of Jewish history and that you will truly appreciate it. And that one day you're going to write an article about it, or you're going to share information about it, and therefore it has a more precious place in your library than it has in mine, and therefore I want to sell it to you. And he sold it to me, it wasn't an expensive item. Um, here it is. And it's not actually an old book, as I'll explain in a minute. Here, here is the book. It's a book that's called Eliod Tzvi HaLevi Soloveitchik Ha'ish Uchsovov. Um, which means Rabbi Elijah Tzvi Halevi uh, Soloveitchik, obviously from the famous Soloveitchik family. And it says, the man and his works, or the man and his writings. And the person who published the book was a man called Dov Hyman, an interesting individual. Let me tell you a little bit about Dov Hyman first before I tell you about Rabbi Eliyahu Soloveitchik. Dov Hyman was a medical doctor. He was born in London as Arthur Hyman. His father was Rabbi Aaron Hyman, who's extremely interesting. He was the head of what was known in England as the London Board of Shechita, which was the most important organization with regard to kosher meat in the early part of the uh, 20th century. And even in my lifetime, when I lived in England, the London Board of Shechita was extremely important. And I think it remains important as a body that represents the interests of Shechita in the UK. But what was important about the London Board of Shechita in the days that Rabbi Hyman was in charge of it was that there were many Shechtim who weren't licensed and therefore would just do Shechita. They would Shecht animals uh, and it wouldn't be kosher, but who would know better? And there were many butchers who would sell non-kosher meat and he presided over the board of Shechita to ensure that all the meat that was sold with the Heksher of the Beisdin in London that was under the auspices of the chief rabbi was kosher meat. It was very, very important. And he was a tough man, but he was also a massive Talmud Chochem. And he published the first um, ever uh, full um, biographical dictionary of all the Amoiraim and Tanoim that can be found in Talmud Babli, Yerushalmi, etc. A fascinating work. I have it at home. I, um, I have the original print. I think it's been reprinted, republished many, many times. His name was Rabbi Aaron Hyman. And he had a son called Dov Hyman. And Dov Hyman went to medical school and trained to be a doctor. And he also became a bibliophile. And he had a huge collection, one of the largest collections in the world, private collections of Judaica, Hebraica, antiquarian Jewish books. And there was no book that wasn't of interest to him. He later moved from London to Beit Vagan, and he was a doctor, I believe a dermatologist, in Sharet Tzedek Hospital. I met him, and he was a very old man by the time I met him. He must have been, I don't know, in his late 80s or 90 years old. He used to occasionally stay for Shabbos in a hotel which no longer exists in Yerushalayim, in Beit Kerem called Pension Reich. And I was once there for Shabbos, and I met him, and I sat with him the whole of Shabbos afternoon and spoke to him. I never got to see his library, but we spoke about uh, uh, Jewish books and Jewish history. He was a fascinating individual. He died in 1997. I know that he was well in his 90s. 
and the, he uh, and there was an obituary written for about him by a man called Tuvia Preshel. I should really devote one of these uh, treasures, or at least a part of one of them, to Tuvia Preshel. He was also a very very interesting man, and you can find that um, uh, um, you can find that. Let me see if I can share it. Um, if I can find it right now, if I can share the obituary that was written about Dov Hyman on the chat um, here uh, during the Zoom, because I think it's an important it's an important obituary, and I think you'll enjoy reading it very very much. Let me see if I can get to that. Um, here we go. Uh, I've just sent it now. That's uh, Tuvia Preshel writing about Rabbi uh, so Dr. Arthur Dov Hyman. Now. Back to the book about Rabbi Yohu Soloveitchik. So what's interesting about this book, first of all, it was published in multiple colors. That, mean, that means I, um, I don't know how many of each color, but there were only 50 published. They are num the numbered copies. Let me show you that. That's an interesting bibliographic device. If somebody wants to ensure that you know that a book is rare, they'll publish, let's say, 50 or 100 or 200 copies, and they will number each copy so that you know that you've got a particularly rare book. So here I have got, here can you see, number 29. Can you see that? 29 out of 50 copies. Nidfas bechamishim otakim memusporim and I've got number 29. Okay? Now, what is interesting about this book is not that just that it's rare and I believe that however rare it is, there is a PDF available for free um, put up there by some some clever person so that even you who don't have an original copy of this book can obtain a copy of the book about Rabbi Yor Soloveitchik that is so rare. You can I don't know how you can find it, but I, I've definitely been sent it in the past, a PDF of this book. How did he come to write this book and what was it about Rabbi Yohu Soloveitchik that was so interesting? Let me tell you a little bit about Rabbi Yohu Soloveitchik. I'm going to tell you through the pages of this book and the reason as I said, that I chose this particular book to open our uh, first session of treasures from the rabbi's library is because this book was sold to me, belonged to Moshe Leib Weiser. If you see here, this is the inscription um, to Moshe Leib Weiser from Dov Hyman. It was a book that belonged to Moshe Leib Weiser, which he sold to me very, very generously about 15 or 20 years ago. And I want to share this book and the story of this book in his memory. And that's how we will begin. Here is a picture of Rabbi Eliyahu Soloveitchik. There he is. It's a curious picture because the clothes, I spoke about sartorial elegance before. The clothes and the pose is not one that one would naturally identify with um, an individual of uh, rabbinic descent. He's dressed in what looks like a velvet cloak and a velvet smoking jacket and he is um, sitting on a very elegant couch or high-backed chair um, holding a book. It looks more like the pose of a university professor or of some, uh, yeah, I hate to use the word in Yiddish, of a galach, of you know the Archbishop of Canterbury. Doesn't really look like some, if I would tell you this is a picture of a man called Rabbi Soloveitchik, it wouldn't naturally, this picture wouldn't naturally come to mind. But Rabbi Leo Soloveitchik was uh, part of the very famous Soloveitchik dynasty. The Soloveitchik dynasty began in Kovna Slabodka. Uh, and you can read, there's a number of different books about the Soloveitchik dynasty. Uh, they began, uh, there was a lumber merchant by the name Soloveitchik, he lived in Kovna. He founded, more or less, the Jewish community of Slabodka, which, of course, became extremely important in the latter part of the 19th century as the home of two major yeshivas. And Slabodka was um, across the river from Kovna. So I don't know if you know this, that in Europe it occasionally happens that there's a river that runs through two towns of different names. For example, I studied in Gateshead Yeshiva. On the other side of the Tyne River was Newcastle. Essentially, it's one conurbation, it's one town, but one town is called, one side of the river is called Gateshead, the other side of the river is called Newcastle. Similarly, in, um, in Kovna Slabodka, there was a river running through it, and on one side of the river is Kovna, which was a major city, 
And on the other side of the river, a suburb, I guess, of Kovna, that's called Slabodka. And of course, the people from Slabodka were very proud of the fact that they came from a more exclusive community. The truth is, um, today, if you go there, there's no big difference between um, Kovna and Slabodka. Uh, they are backwaters. They're not considered major cities in Europe anymore. I don't think they ever were. But in the Jewish world, both Kovna and Slabodka were extremely important. We know that Rabbi Yitzchak Elchonon Specter, who was one of the principal rabbis, for the Litvish Jewish of the Litvish community uh, in Europe in the latter part of the 19th century, he was the chief rabbi of Kovna. And as I explained earlier, you had two major yeshivas in Slabodka, one of which uh, uh, took the name Slabodka, even though it was called something else. It was called uh, Knesset Yisrael. It became known as Slabodka Yeshiva. And the, the Rosh Yeshiva was known as the Alta of Slabodka, moved to Hebron in the mid 1920s and became Hebron Yeshiva. And then a Slabodka yeshiva moved a little bit later, moved to Bnei Brak. There's still a Slabodka yeshiva and there's a Hebron yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, both of uh, which are, as it were, descendants of the Slabodka yeshiva that existed in the latter part of the 19th century, in the early part of the 20th century. I mentioned Rabbi Ferber at the beginning of this episode. Rabbi Ferber was born in Slabodka and he goes to great pains to explain how important Slabodka was in the Jewish world, as you'll see when the book is published. Uh, he describes every nook and cranny and street and tailor and schnorra and rabbi, of course, that lived in Slabodka in the years when he was growing up in the last two decades of the 19th century. So Rabbi Leo Soloveitchik was um, either son or grandson of the original Soloveitchik. His nephew, that means his brother's son, was none other than Rabbi Yosha Ber Soloveitchik, who wrote a sefer called the Beis Halevi, and was one of the Rosh Hashivas of Elojin, and um, he was married to a descendant of, um, no, he was himself descended from Reb Chaim of Elojin. I believe that his mother was a granddaughter of Reb Chaim of Elojin. And Rabbi Yo Soloveitchik, during the time when his nephew was the Rosh Hashiva, was roped in by the Volozhin family, um, Reb Chaim, Reb, uh, I think it was Rabbi Yitzchak Soloveitchik, to be a uh, collector. They needed to raise money for the yeshiva. Nothing changes, right? You have a yeshiva, you need a fundraiser. So Rabbi Leo Soloveitchik became a fundraiser for Volozhin Yeshiva. And he traveled all over Western Europe. Uh, they, I guess there was a collector for Eastern Europe, but he became extremely familiar with some of the more interesting elements of the Jewish world beyond the very cloistered Jewish world that he had emerged from. And he became somewhat knowledgeable and much more comfortable in that world. And eventually he left his own world and he blended into the world of Berlin, Paris, London. And as that, um, I guess that photo or the picture that I showed you earlier, it is a photo, testifies, he seemed to be very, very comfortable in that world. Now, why was Rabbi Leo Soloveitchik of any interest to Dov Hyman, the book collector, that he would have published a rare book in 50 copies to describe the man and his writings? I'll explain to you. I'm going to read through the first part of the book. You can be here. This is the first page of the book. He says, Ma'ase shahoya kachoya. This is the story. Lifnei chadoshim Misbar Hanikra Kol Koira. A few months ago, I obtained a book called Kol Koira. Shenitvas Mechodosh Baosios Shemishtamshim by Hem Bismana Achrem Beret Yisrael. It was printed using the font that we are familiar seeing uh, um, in latter times, in modern times here in Israel. And he obviously was fascinated by the book for the following reason. Rak hashar hutzilu mehatfus harishon shall Paris. He says the shar, that means the title page, was the original title page of the book as it had been published in Paris in, in its first year of publication. I'm going to show you um, a version of that title page. This is not the Paris edition. This is the London edition from 1868. Here is, the, here is the title page. Can you see it? The title page of Kol Koire. What is Kol Koire? 
Kol Kaira is a book, and here's the translation in English, the law, the Talmud, and the gospel. And it officially says here, it's by several literary men, that in fact, it was a book that was written by Rabbi Eliyahu Soloveitchik, and it was um, translated into various languages. What can you tell, if you look at this, what can you tell about the font? Is there anything that you can see about the font? The font, the English font, not the Hebrew font. The English font is a font that was typically used by the church. The church always used, it's a, it's a Latin, I don't know exactly the name of the font, but that look is a church look. I'm going to cut to the chase here in this story because it's such a fascinating story. It's something that uh, will completely amaze you and befuddle you. Rabbi Yo Soloveitchik, who was no doubt a great scholar of Talmud and of Torah, became convinced that the end of the Jewish exile could only come about if there was peace between Christians and Jews. And therefore, he wrote this book. I'm going to read you the prefatory remarks of the book that he wrote. It may perhaps appear presumptive in us to undertake writing a commentary on a book like the New Testament and to choose a path which has already been trodden by so many. Thousands of various expositions have already appeared and we may with some degree of justice be asked, what can you hope to add to that which has already been advanced? But our object, this is the introduction to Kol Kore, our object is not to comment, but impelled by the circumstances of the times, so eventful in themselves and so important in their bearing as to the cause of God, we desire to institute an inquiry into the cause of an existing misunderstanding. For since the fire of dispute has been kindled in the camp of our Hebrew brethren, it has divided the worshippers of God into two. Two sections, the one Jews and the other Christians. Does it not appear marvellous to contemplate that after the lapse of centuries, when empires have crumbled into the dust, monarchies have ceased to exist, dynasties have fallen into decay, persecutions have passed into oblivion, and yet that fire of contention has not ceased, but is still raging with its primitive fury. This contention is now being renewed by an article which has appeared in the Quarterly Review on the Talmud. The writer of the article, being a Jew, holds up the Talmud as a divine oracle. And the Jewish Chronicle, that's the newspaper in England, on the strength of that article and its having been permitted to appear in a Christian magazine, the Quarterly Review, infers that the Gospels are but a Greek translation of the Talmud. I'm just, I've read you a brief section, a very brief um, piece of the introduction. The purpose of the book by Rabbi Elio Soloveitchik was to create an understanding between Jews and Christians that would enable them to appreciate each other and to see each other as friends and as fellow God worshippers all heading in the same direction. Now you may say that's a wonderful thing indeed, as you know, I myself ha have very close friendships with Christian pastors and bishops, and we all yearn for the same, as it were, messianic redemption, albeit they believe he's already come and he's coming for a second time, and we believe that he's only coming for the first time. Nevertheless, what happened to this book and what really struck uh, Dov Hyman and motivated him to write this particular book was that Kol Kaira kept on being published and republished and published again and guess who published it? Not Jews and not Christians looking for friendship with Jews but missionaries. Here is a copy of the title page of Kol Kaira of a version that was published by Christian missionaries to give out to Jews in Jerusalem, in Israel. This was published in 1985 in Jerusalem, and it was published by a group of people, I haven't checked them out to see if they still exist, called the Jerusalem Center for Biblical Studies and Research. 
It's a name that hides the true intentions of the group. It was a missionary group that had a lot of money from missionaries around the world and from Christian supporters around the world to convert the Jews to Christianity. So this work of Rabbi Eliyahu Soloveitchik, who was a scion of the Soloveitchik dynasty, the erstwhile Meshulach for Volozhin Yeshiva, whose photo I showed you a little bit earlier, this book, which was meant, had as its central purpose the reconciliation of Jews and Christians became a tool in the hands of Christian missionaries to convert Jews to Christianity. Isn't that fascinating? Who would have believed it? Now I'm going to show you two more things with reference to this book. And as you can see, it's a fascinating story in and of itself. The first is, this is a copy of another work by Rabbi Eliyahu Soloveitchik. It's the first ever translation into English. Can you see it there? The first ever translation into English of the Rambam's Yad HaChazoka. We all know about the Soloveitchik method, the Briska method of studying the Talmud, where they take a piece of Rambam, Maimonides, and they work backwards into the Gemara, and through the Rambam, they understand what the Gemara means. Rather than go to the Gemara and then see the Rambam, first you look at the Rambam and then you see the Gemara in a totally different light. It can unlock a whole sugya. And when you have differences in a Rambam in one place and in another place, that difference, that seeming contradiction, can sometimes unlock a whole new level of understanding into a piece of Talmud. That's the Briska method, which was really put together by the Soloveitchik family. And ultimately, Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik, who was the grandfather of the Rabbi Yosheber, Rabbi J.B. Soloveitchik of Yeshiva University, and of course the father of the Briskarov, who um, founded the Brisk Yeshiva through his son in, in Yerushalayim. His son was also called Rabbi Yosheber. So they um, have this as the method by which they teach Talmud. To this, to this day, the Briska method is the method by which they teach Talmud. But you can see that the fascination with the Rambam was not something that began with Rabbi Chaim Soloveitchik or his father, uh, the Beis Halevi, but the previous generation. Rabbi Leo Soloveitchik is writing, this book was published in 1863, um, and it was had as its supporters, Baron James de Rothschild, here's the list of supporters you can see here, um, Baron James de Rothschild, Chief Rabbi Adler of London, um, the Chief Rabbi of Paris of France, Rabbi Ullman. Um, there's various other very famous names that are included here in this translation of the Rambam into English, the first ever translation. And it's a fascinating, it's an absolutely fascinating translation. It's beautifully put together. It was published um, in, in a very nice edition. It's not the brittle paper that one is familiar with from the 19th century. And it's not the type of uh, very tatty cover. Uh, the boards that cover the book are also very nice and it's embossed in gold. And you can see that Rabbi Lior Soloveitchik had a deep appreciation of Jewish learning. And he wasn't just trying to reconcile Christians and Jews. Let's just show you one more piece. It's not a book. Uh, it's an article. And it's an article that uh, was written by Shaul Magid, who's a, a dear friend of mine, Professor Shaul Magid. And it's titled, it was published in 2012, Soloveitchik, who loved Jesus, is the headline of the article. There you go, with a picture of him. A Yale president's forebear was an enigmatic and pro-Christian member of the famed rabbinic dynasty. Can you believe that? The president of Yale University, Peter Salovey, I don't know exactly how to pronounce his name, Salovey maybe, his appointment to the presidency of Yale University, founded by Congregationalist ministers, was a cause for celebration for those who admire the Soloveitchik dynasty, an illustrious family of rabbis from Lithuania, etc. In a breathless column, a writer for the Yale Daily News reported on the new president's rabbinic lineage under which Salovey himself commented, 
proudly affirming his place in the family tree as he had come to understand it. It turns out that the president of Yale is descended from none other than Rabbi Eliyahu Soloveitchik, and that's a story in and of itself. We'll um, perhaps post this uh, link to this article uh, when we post the video on YouTube so that you can read the article for yourself. So, a fascinating vignette, a scion of the Soloveitchik dynasty who became a Christian lover and friend of Christians, a true Talmud scholar. Uh, there's no indication that he ever abandoned his Orthodox um, Judaism or his illustrious roots as a member of the Soloveitchik family, and yet his works came to be used by Christian missionaries in Jerusalem, a fact that fascinated Dov Hyman so much that he published a limited edition book um, of which I have one copy. So we'll take it from, we'll end that little vignette here and we'll move on to the next one, which is a story of great interest and intrigue, but one which has been uh, more or less forgotten. Now, um, I once bought in London a collection of what's known as the Jewish Historical Societies um, of England's Transactions. What that means is, I don't know if the Jewish Historical Society is quite as active as it used to be, but it used to be an extremely important um, um, club, I guess to call it, I don't, not, I don't know what to call it. it. It was a group of people who all shared a fascination with uh, Jew, uh, of Jewish history, and particularly the Jewish history of Great Britain. And they would deliver papers, I don't know, five, ten times a year. They would get together. I would guess that, um, to be fair to them, that they were amateur historians, or at least being historians wasn't their primary function, except for the um, long-time president of the uh, Jewish Historical Society. His name was Cecil Roth. He was a very famous historian and wrote dozens of books. And eventually he became the editor-in-chief of the Encyclopedia Judaica, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Cecil Roth presided over the um, publication of transactions of the Jewish Historical Society for many years, but the, its publication preceded him. I have here, um, and by the way, it's dozens of volumes. There must be, I don't know, 40, 50, 60 volumes of transactions. And I once bought a full run um, until sometime in the 1970s it became available. I don't have, and I'm sure they continue to be published, because I know that I was a member of the Jewish Historical Society when I lived in London, and they did used to send out, by that time it wasn't a, an august publication, it was a paperback publication, but they would send it annually. I have a few copies from the early 2000s, and I'm sure it continues to be published once a year. But here is uh, a copy of the 1951-2 to two, um, transactions of the Jewish Historical Society, and there's a particular article in there which drew my attention uh, quite a number of years ago. It's an article about Solomon Bennett. Can you see there the title page? I'm not sure if you can see that. Um, Solomon Bennett. Solomon Bennett, artist, Hebraist, and controversialist. It's on page 91 of volume uh, 17 of the transactions. And it was by a man, the article, the paper was originally read and then um, rewritten for publication by a man called Arthur Barnett. He was the uh, principal Jewish chaplain for the British, uh, British forces during the First World War between 1914 and 1918. And then he was a cousin or sort of assistant rabbi in New West End Synagogue, which was in St. Petersburg Place, a very, very uh, prestigious synagogue in the centre of London. It still exists. Then he was a rabbi in Bristol between 1920 and 1924. And then he became the rabbi of an independent shul that didn't belong to the chief rabbi's group of shuls called the Western Synagogue um, until 1954. And then he retired. He died in 1961. The Western Synagogue was later absorbed into Marble Arch Synagogue, which I know many people have attended. If they ever stay in central London over Shabbos, um, they will attend Marble Arch Synagogue. Well, there's a room upstairs, the Beis Medrash, uh, is the former Western Synagogue, and this uh, Reverend Barnett, as he was known, was the rabbi of Western Synagogue for th uh, 30 years, between 1924 and 1954. Anyway, he writes this 
fascinating article about a man called Solomon Bennett. I'm going to tell you the story, uh, not necessarily as he tells it, although uh, it's interesting in the way that he tells it as well, and I would certainly recommend that you look up the article. Um, I'm going to begin by looking um, at a book that he actually cites, and the book is uh, an interesting book in and of itself, published by a man called Rabbi, uh, not Rabbi, um, Dr. Dushinsky. I always wonder if he's, uh, if he's related to the rabbi, the rabbinic dynasty, the Dushinsky. Do you know there's a Dushinsky Rebbe in Yerushalayim who comes from the Dushinsky family, a Hungarian family. I just wonder if he's, he was related. Anyway, Dr. Dushinsky wrote a book called The Rabbinate of the Great Synagogue, London. The Great Synagogue was the main Ashkenazi synagogue in London. And he's written a book. What's interesting about the book is that, unfortunately, the... Um, records and manuscripts that uh, were kept for, I don't know, a couple of hundred years by the British Jewish community were all destroyed during the Blitz, the Nazi Blitz against London in 1940. And as a result, we don't have records, we don't have the originals of those manuscripts. But this book was published in 1922. I've actually got a second edition. But this book was published in 1922, and he had access to all the manuscripts. So the back of the book in, in Hebrew is all the manuscripts, in both in, in original Hebrew. It's not um, photographed. He's actually transcribed all the manuscripts of the correspondence of the rabbis of the Great Synagogue in London, and all the different uh, cases that came before the based in in London, let's say in the 1700s, he's transcribed all those documents and reproduced them in this book. It's the only record we have of, of that, and that makes it a fascinating book. But with regard to Solomon Bennett, the controversialist, he writes as follows. Um, he says that uh, there was a book that came out called Elements of Faith, and it was a catechism. What's a catechism? I bet if you'd ask your children and grandchildren what a catechism is, they wouldn't know. But it was extremely important um, during the early years of a child's life to be given religious instruction. And a catechism is the word in English to describe a religious textbook. So it's not the Bible. It's not what we would, let's say, refer to as the Shulchan Aruch. But it's a book that one can turn to to get an understanding of what it means to be a, re a religious person of a particular religious persuasion. Now, Christians always produced catechism, but the Jews never did, because in their traditional heartlands in Europe, they didn't need it. They had a cheder. The kids went to cheder, and that's all they studied. They need to have a catechism. Until the Enlightenment period, in the early part of the 19th century, when suddenly there were Jews living in Western Europe who were attending non-Jewish schools, and they needed, needed to be given religious instruction. So they had Hebrew schools, but what did you teach kids who couldn't read Hebrew? What do you teach them? How do you describe their religious background to them? So this was the very first ever Jewish catechism that was produced for the English-speaking world. It was called Elements of Faith. And the author of Elements of Faith was a man, I have actually an original copy of Elements of Faith, here it is. Um, I had it bound in leather some years ago. It's a beautiful copy, an absolutely sensational copy. Shoroshe Emuna, do you see it there? Shoroshe Emuna, published in London in 1815. So the um, author was a man called Rabbi Shalom Cohen. Don't be fooled by the word rabbi. He was a maskil. That means he was somebody who hovered somewhere in between complete assimilation and traditional Judaism. He was extremely knowledgeable in Judaism, but he, I guess, had some kind of university education, or certainly um, uh, he would have had a secular education of some sort, sufficient that he could write this book in a catechism form, which was not um, necessarily a genre that was familiar to rabbis of the era. And it was translated into English by a man called Yeshua van Oven. And uh, both of these people were, uh, for a time, resided in England. So if you see here, there's the Hebrew on one side, 
and the English is on the other side. And he says here, um, it is a notable portion man receives from God, a sublime inheritance from the omnipotent to possess the emanation of an inquiring spirit which seeks the knowledge and understanding of things surrounding him and draws comparative conclusions from material to immaterial existence, thus gradually ascending the ladder of science at length arrives at the sublime comprehension of things imperceptible to more to mere corporeal sense. Now, I think it's wonderful that it was translated into such highfalutin English, but I can't imagine giving this to an early teenager and that they would make any sense of it. They wouldn't have been able to read the Hebrew, nor would they have been particularly taken by the English translation, even though perhaps they spoke a better English than some of us. Nevertheless, it doesn't strike me as a book that makes much sense to be used as a textbook. But much more importantly than that, I'm not going to sit here and critique Sharashe Emuna, Elements of Faith. I want to uh, point out the fact that it was endorsed by none other than the chief rabbi of uh, the United Kingdom uh, uh, in those days of Great Britain, a man called Solomon Herschel. Here we have it. Here is the Haskoma of Solomon Herschel, who was the chief rabbi of, um, of Great Britain at that time. He was, the f he was Britain's, actually Britain's first chief rabbi. His father had been the rabbi of um, the London's Great Synagogue from the late 1750s until the early 1760s, and he was actually born in London. But his, his father abandoned uh, the London community, because as described by Dr. Dushinsky in his excellent book, the community in London seemed to lack any interest in religious um, uh, life. And the, he tried to start a yeshiva. It was a complete failure. And in fact, when he announced that he was leaving one Shabbos in Adrosha, they sent a delegation to him to ask him why he was leaving London. What, what had they done wrong? And his answer to them was, thank you for asking that Shiloh. It's the first Shiloh anybody's asked me since I got to London. So I think that that, and he was apparently a very witty man. So he got his message across that uh, he was of no interest as a rabbi. And he moved um, first to Halberstadt and then he became the rabbi in Berlin. And it's interesting um, that he was a rabbi in Berlin during the era of Moses Mendelssohn and never objected to him. That's a story in and of itself. Um, and in a previous talk that I had given, I've described his other son, Rabbi Shaul Berlin, who, uh, who wrote a forged work based on what he said were manuscripts of the Rosh, a Rishain, uh, one of the medieval rabbinic scholars, called Besomim Rosh, but you'll have to watch that other lecture, that other talk that I gave about Rabbi Shaul Berlin to hear a little bit more about that. But his second son was... Rabbi uh, Shloima Herschel, Solomon Herschel, and he became the chief rabbi of Great Britain in 1842. And in 1815, he endorsed this work with quite a nice letter. Yan Ra'isi Shechibur Kozea Sher Ani HaToyroni HaMushlim. He says that this wonderful work that was shown to me by this uh, great uh, uh, and um, uh, full Torah scholar. Um, Chacham the Sofer, a, a wise scholar and writer, Hamelitz Anoida Basha'orim, somebody who is, uh, I guess the, word, the best way of, of translating that is a great propagandist on behalf of the, of the Jewish people. And we're talking about Sholem HaKoyen, Echad Mimase Yodov, he showed me one of his works, Shorashe Emuna, Humin HaChebra Bismanenu, Boy Yelide Amenu Zera Yisrael. He basically was endorsing this book as a catechism for the Jewish youth of his day. All right, sounds fair enough. Sholem Cohen went back to Europe and never returned to London, and he lived out his life there. I have a wonderful article about him. Um, incidentally, I have a, um, an original manuscript of Sholem Cohen, written in English, actually. Uh, and we're going to put this out as a... We'll include this, Carly as a, an image on the video, um, and he sent it to one of the princes in Europe. I guess this became a propaganda book that Sholem Cohen sent to 
many different destinations. It wasn't just used as a catechism for kids in school, but it was used as a propaganda tool for Jews who were in Western Europe who wanted to present themselves in the most positive light to the non-Jews who, uh, who ruled over them. But um, as mentioned here in the book by Dushinsky, um, uh, who describes the incident that I'm about to share with you, it would appear that some of the elements of faith as presented by Cohen in his book, which was tr translated by Van Oven, were not quite as faithful to the Jewish faith as those who were traditional might have wished for. That means that perhaps for kids in school who were brought up in more assimilated homes, they would not have sensed that elements of faith wasn't as keen on Jewish dogma as it should have been. But for those who were trained in the traditional Jewish world and the yeshiva world, and who came from very traditional Jewish backgrounds, they read through elements of faith, Sharashe and Munah, and they were horrified. But who would have read it in London? I mean, it can't have been um, Solomon Herschel because he endorsed the book. So who would have read it? Step into the field, a man called Yomtuf Bennett. Yomtuf Bennett to pronounce his name correctly, but he became known in England as Solomon Bennett. Who was Solomon Bennett? A curious figure. I'm going to find, I have a picture of him somewhere. Let me see if I can find it. We're going to get to this book in a moment, but you can see here a picture. That's a picture of Solomon Bennett. Does he look like a rabbi or a Rosh Hashiva to you? I don't think so. Solomon Bennett read Sharashe Emuna and was absolutely horrified by what he saw. How is it possible that this could be used as a training manual for vulnerable Jewish children? What type of behavior is this? How can you publish a book? And much worse than that, how can Solomon Herschel, the son of um, Reb Tzvi Hersh Berlin, and the great-grandson of none other than Chacham Tzvi Ashkenazi, the great-nephew of Rabbi Yaakov Emden, endorse a book which contains not borderline heresy, but actual heresy against the Jewish faith. How is that even possible? Who was Yom Tov Bennett? Yom Tov Bennett, Solomon Bennett, was somebody whose father was a fairly prominent rabbi in Europe, but who had drifted away from religious practice because he was very artistic. And although he received a classical, um, traditional Jewish training and education, he was no longer religious by the time he got to London. He'd become quite an acclaimed engraver. And as an engraver, he always had work in those days because there was no such thing as photographs. And therefore, if somebody made a painting and they wanted that painting to appear in print, the only way you could print a painting was to create an engraving of the painting. And that engraving, which used, I guess, I mean, I don't understand the mechanics of it, but the lines would be able to create an impression on a printed page that would give the appearance of a painting. So instead of, you couldn't have a photograph, but at the very least you could have an engraving that would, and there were quite, the, by the way, what I just showed you, that picture of Solomon Bennett is a self-portrait. It's an engraving of him taken from a painting of him that he made for himself. And he uh, was uh, a very well-known engraver living in London. I can't imagine it was an easy job to have. I'm sure that there were, uh, there were times when he made money and times when he didn't have money. It's not easy to be an artist. And at the, when he had spare time, he would continue in his Jewish studies. He never lost his love of the study of Gomorrah. Anyway, he wrote a book. It didn't come out right away. And the book is called Tene Bikurim. Tene Bikurim is a very interesting book. Um, it's called Tene Bikurim. It's really... Vuhu Igeres Bikeres. It's a letter of protest. What is the letter of protest? Al Sefer Ma'at Hakamus 
the Rafe Ha'echus. Basically, he wanted to uh, completely repel any idea that the book Shorashe Emuna represented a true um, picture of the Jewish faith as should be presented to Jewish youth when educating them. Shorashe Emuna by Shalom HaKoin, and it was translated, he says here, by the Roife, the doctor, Yoshua van Oven, and he writes his name as Yom Tov Burnett. It was published in London in 1817, so two years afterwards. And he is extremely disappointed by the book. He's extremely disappointed, more disappointed, by the fact that Rabbi Herschel would have been given, uh, would have given a, an approbation for that book. Um, so let me hit a collection of rabbinical discussions and criticisms. Bennett accuses the rabbi of giving his approbation to a book which did not contain the elements of faith, but in many instances, elements of unbelief. And it, I have to say that despite the fact that it was a critical work, it wasn't written in a very critical style. It was written simply, and it's a, it's a small pamphlet, it's not many pages, uh, it was written in a way to present the case, the opposite case, as was presented in Elements of Faith, in areas where Shara Shemuna, Elements of Faith, was failing. But it would seem that Rabbi Solomon Herschel took this all very, very personally. He wasn't happy at all that somebody would criticise him. It's interesting, Rabbi Solomon Herschel had one of the largest private collections of Sforim and manuscripts that is known to have existed in those days within the Orthodox rabbinate. He later on gifted it, most of it, to the Baisdin Library, and it was housed by the London Baisdin, the court of the chief rabbi in their base medrash, for many, many years, more than a hundred years. Um, and later on it was moved to the head office of the United Synagogue, which is the body of synagogues under the auspices of the chief rabbi. Unfortunately, it got caught up in quite a scandal in the 1990s when one of the Dayonim was discovered to have stolen many of the rare books that were contained in this former library of Rabbi Solomon Herschel, now belonging to the London based in. And as a result, those books needed to be retrieved. That Dayan, um, who I've mentioned previously, had to be um, let go of. And he moved to Eretz Yisrael. He subsequently died. And the books were sold on auction in a number of auctions in New York in the late 1990s. And just to come full circle, the person who catalogued the based in library, that was the library of Solomon Herschel in the late 1990s for the London based in, was none other than Moshe Leib Weiser. And he was the one who, he was the only one of, I have to tell you, a particular profession, the Jewish book dealing profession, which is not known for its great honesty and integrity. He was the only one at that time, more than 20 years ago, that the London based in, that was headed by Dain Chanach Erentroy, and he needs a refur shalema, unfortunately, Dain Erentroy um, has been taken quite ill over the past few weeks. At that time, he was the Rosh Bezdin in London. He hired Moshe Leib Weiser and asked him to catalog the library. He was the only one that was trusted to to come up with a correct listing and pricing for all the items in the library and they were later sold on auction in Sotheby's and by Kestenbaum Auction House in New York. Solomon Herschel may have been known as a bibliophile and as a collector, what he was not known for was his scholarship. In fact, he leaves us no written works and so much so that it is argued that when he died, it took three years to choose a new chief rabbi because the community was at great pains to make sure that whoever replaced him, first of all, would be able to speak another language besides for Yiddish, uh, preferably English, and second of all, would be a great scholar of Judaism that not only um, could study Torah and Talmud, but also would be able to produce works of great note. They chose, of course, Rabbi Dr. Nathan Marcus Adler, who was a distant relative of Solomon Herschel, interestingly enough, and he did produce a definitive work on Targum Unculus called Nasina Lager, 
which was a parish on, ta on Targum, on the translation of Unculus that accompanies the Hebrew text of the Chumash um, in all of our Chumashim. And he was a significant scholar who could speak several languages, including, um, of course, Hebrew, Yiddish, German and English, and I believe also French. His son also became the chief rabbi after him in 1891 when he died. His son, Rabbi Dr. Naftali Herman Adler, became the chief rabbi. He died in 1910, and then the dynasty ended. But um, Rabbi Herschel was not known for his great scholarship. They published a book against the Tena Bikurim of Banet, and it was published in the name of a man called um, Rintel, I believe. It's a terrible book. M. M. Rintel. Here's the, here's the title page of the book. Minchas Kanos. Minchas Kanos essentially ripped Bennett's book to pieces and said that he's a disgusting person. I have various quotes of the book um, here in the transactions, uh, which I mentioned earlier, the article by Arthur Barnett. Absolutely fascinating um, what Rintel wrote. And what's particularly interesting, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, what's particularly interesting about Rintel's book, Mayor Rintel, his name was, was Mayor Rintel was, is not known for his great scholarship either. It would appear that the book was written by Solomon Herschel, and he published it in the name of Rintel, who was a sheikhet, and later was accused of something and had to move up to Glasgow because he had to run away from London. But in any event, he wrote some of the most terrible things possible against Yom Tov Bennett for having criticized a sitting chief rabbi, how dare he, and he tore him to pieces. Now, I have to tell you that Rintel's book, Minchas Kanois, is extremely rare. Very, very rare. But it's not as rare as the book which was published by Yom Tov Bennett in response to Rintel's book. That book is called The Present Reign of the Synagogue at Duke's Place Displayed. That's the book that contains the photograph or the engraving that I showed you earlier. But here's the title page. The title page is um, uh, of the book The Present Reign and a series, it's a series of critical Theological and Rabbinical Discussions on a Hebrew Pamphlet entitled Minchas Kanoz, written by Solomon Bennett, Yom Tov Bennett. And it's a book in which he essentially takes not Rintel's book apart, but the chief rabbinate of um, Solomon Herschel apart. He says that Solomon Herschel is not a person who is worthy of, of being a rabbi, and the only reason he's a rabbi in England, unlike his father who ran away from England because it was such a poor Jewish community, the reason he's a rabbi in England is because he couldn't make it anywhere else. He is a total failure as a rabbi. He just sits in his study all day and studies. He's never taken a position on anything. He can't even speak English, and uh, all the um, so-called congregants of his community hold him in complete contempt as evidenced by the fact that whenever they have a dispute between each other, they don't go in front of his Beisdin, but they go to the secular courts. And the only disputes that he ever has to preside over are disputes between the lowest classes of Jew that lives in London. And he is a totally useless person. This book is extremely rare. I saw that it was um, up for sale in Kestenbaum some years ago. Um, I, I, have, I bought a copy many, many years ago, and I can assure you I didn't pay this price for it, but here is, is the um, estimate as presented by Kestenbaum for this booklet, um, The Present Reign of the Synagogue of Duke's Place Displayed. Um, it was, uh, this auction was, I'm trying to see when it actually was, it was in 2016, and the estimate was four to $6,000 for that pamphlet. Extremely rare. Like many critical pamphlets, one can only assume that very few copies were published, 
and that as many copies as possible were obtained by the subject of the criticism, namely Rabbi Herschel himself, and that they destroyed those copies. The British Library does not have a copy of it. It doesn't exist in most of the public libraries in the world. I'm only aware of two other copies in existence, and it's uh, Re Reverend Barnett who wrote the article in um, for the 1951 to 2 transactions based on his presentation of 1949 says that he'd never seen a copy. So that's how rare that book is. Yontuf Bennett, why did he hate Solomon Herschel so much? And with this we will end. It seems that as an engraver, he'd been asked to engrave a, um, a depiction of Solomon Herschel and he'd got involved in a dispute that ended up in the courts for which he had to pay £100, a huge sum of money in the early 1800s. I'm not sure if this is the engraving in question, but I do have a copy of this particular engraving. There are quite a number of engravings and portraits of Rabbi Solomon Herschel, who seems to have been very photogenic, if you can call someone who does well in portraits photogenic. As you can see, he's wearing a very nice streimel. He's got big payas and a beard, and he's wearing a white beckisher and a cravat. Um, I don't know if that's the engraving that was done by Solomon ben Bennett, but he clearly harboured a grudge against Solomon Herschel. I think somewhere in between his criticisms and Rabbi Herschel being a great rabbi lies the truth. I imagine he wasn't as good as he couldn't have, could have been, but he wasn't quite as bad as Solomon Bennett made him out to be. And that ends that particular vignette, a vignette that describes a feud between a, f a lapsed Jew from a traditional background and the chief rabbi of Great Britain in the early 1800s, both of them fairly forgotten. Uh, there is a wonderful piece by Rabbi Dr. Raymond Apple, which you can find on his website. He was formerly the rabbi of Bayswater Synagogue and later in Carly's Sydney Great Synagogue, and he um, put together a whole lecture on the rabbinate on, of Rabbi Herschel, of Rabbi Solomon Herschel. You can find it, perhaps we will post that as well on the YouTube, Carly, so that we can um, inform and educate all of our watchers and listeners to the greatest extent possible about the lives and stories relating not just to the books that I have displayed today from my library, but the people who both feature in them and who own them. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for watching. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Treasures from the Rabbi's Library.